Well, now that we've been introduced to the Bohr model, we're ready to do some calculations. We're going to focus on the energies of the electrons as represented in the energy well. Keep in mind that the energy of the electron gets more negative as it goes deeper in the energy well. We'll be able to calculate the energies of individual electron orbits and also the energies of photons, which are absorbed when the electron jumps from a lower orbit to a higher one, or photons which are released when the electron jumps from a higher orbit to a lower orbit. We're here with Bracken Godfrey today, and we're going to dig a little deeper into this energy well idea associated with uh, the Bohr model and see how it can be used to do quantitative kinds of problems. All right. Now, the first principle that we uh, want to examine is this proportionality. We say, according to the Bohr model, that the energy of a given orbit varies inversely as the square of the orbit number. E varies as 1 over n squared. Right. Now, this is a really handy relationship, because if that is true, then the following has to be true. Notice that on the top, in this new equation, we see the same kind of relationship as in the proportionality, but for n1 and e1. Okay. And on the bottom, we see this relationship for n2 and e2. Right. Because the proportionality is true, then the ratio of the proportionalities is an equation that we can then manipulate. Now, just as a reminder for ourselves, let's make a note that n1 refers to the first orbit down here, right. and n2 refers to the second orbit. Okay. Now, let's look back at this equation that we just generated. Right. This equation can be simplified, right? Exactly. How would you do that? Just take the reciprocal of the 1 over the n2 squared, and then the 1 over n1 squared, you can do that by putting the n2 over n1, both Let, of them squared. Great. Let's take a look at how that works. Good. Now we have a much simpler equation, and we're to the point where we could start substituting in numbers. Exactly. Our goal here is to try to find out what the energy of one of the orbits is if we know what the energy of the other one is. And we know both n1 and n2 already. Yeah, what are they? 1 for n1 and 2 for n2. Right, okay. So we have now uh, n2 squared, which is 4, over n1 squared, which is 1. one. Right, okay. We still don't know what E1 and E2 are. If we did know what one of those was, then we could figure out what the other one is, couldn't we? Exactly. It turns out that you can look up the value of uh, the energy of the very first Bohr orbit in any freshman chemistry textbook. Okay. So let's say we do that and we substitute that in. There's the value right there. Now. It's just straightforward algebra from this point, determining what E2 is. Let's, let's walk through that together here on the screen. All right. Make sure it's clear. If, uh, if our audience has trouble following this, then they might want to um, check with their teacher. Exactly. <laughs> or their TA. Now we have an expression with just one unknown. We have E2 equals this ratio. It's just a matter of dividing by 4, and there's the number that we get. All right. Now, a question for you, Bracken. How does that number compare, the number we've calculated for E2, uh -huh. to the value for E1 that we looked at earlier? Well, E2 appears to be less negative, meaning it's becoming more positive, kind of working its way up towards 0. Right. And... Uh, I think that uh, it's clear that the calculation that we just did then uh, corresponds to the principles of Bohr's model. Exactly. Yeah. Now, hopefully everyone's understood how we did that, and so I guess the next challenge is for you and you folks to try this, uh, this same approach. You, uh, 
this time calculating the value of E3, okay. knowing the value of E1. You want to take a minute and try that? I suggest you hit pause and try that on your own. Okay. Go ahead. Well, welcome back. Let's see, Bracken, what kind of answer did you get? I have energy 3 equals a negative 2.42 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. Looks right to me. Okay, now we have the energies of the first three orbits in Bohr's model. Let's take a look at them. My question for you, Bracken, is do the energies that you see here correspond to the principles we learned about Bohr's model? Yes, uh, they do. It looks like the energies are becoming less negative as the electron goes up in the energy well. And also, the difference in energy between E1 and E2 is greater than the energy difference between E2 and E3. So that there's less energy change as the electron continues to go up in orbits. Good. So the orbits are getting closer together in closer energy together. as we go up in the well. Yes. Very good. As a matter of fact, it's these energy differences that are, are really of greatest significance. Because if you'll recall, it's the energy difference between orbits mm -hmm. that predicts what energy or color of photon will be released when the electron jumps down from right. the higher orbit to the lower, lower orbit. So, in as much as we now have the energy values for each of those orbits, uh -huh. we ought to be able to calculate that energy difference and then use that in turn to calculate the energy or even the wavelength or frequency, color if you will, of photons that will be released for this particular atom. Okay. So let's take a look. Let's take a look first, in fact, at the energy difference between orbit 2 and orbit 1. In order to get that difference, we simply substitute the values that we obtained for the energies of those two orbits, and that difference turns out to be 1.64 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. That's the difference between orbit 2 and orbit 1. Mm -hmm. And we could do the same thing now to calculate the difference between orbit 3 and orbit 1. Here are those values, and here's the difference. Notice again that because the orbits are further apart, E3 and E1, that the energy difference we, we obtain, 1.94 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, is bigger than the energy difference between E1 to E2, which is only 1.64 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Right. Okay, now that we know the energy differences between the orbits, we ought to be able to calculate the wavelength of a photon that would be emitted when the electron falls from the higher orbit to the lower orbit. Now, take your choice. Shall we calculate the wavelength for E3 to E1 or E2 to E1? Why don't we do E3 to E1? Okay, that sounds good. Okay, now Bracken, can you remember the relationship between the energy of a photon and its wavelength? Yeah, um, the energy of a photon equals the hc over the wavelength, over the lambda. Okay. Uh, let's remind ourselves now what each of these terms means. Okay. Um, h is Planck's constant, and c equals to the speed of light. Lambda is the wavelength, and e is energy. All right. And in case you've forgotten the values of h and c, here they are. So at this point, let's hit pause and have you go ahead and calculate the wavelength of the photon that will be emitted when the electron jumps from E3 to E1. Okay. Okay. Okay, Bracken, let's show the folks what you got. Okay. Here it is. Now notice that this uh, wavelength is actually in the UV region of light. 
So we wouldn't actually see with our eye uh, the photon that's emitted when the electron makes this particular jump. But it's interesting uh, that we could do this calculation for the electron jumping from any one of those orbits to any other. We could determine what color is emitted. And in fact, that's what we did in the previous section on the Bohr model when we related each individual line in the emission spectrum to a particular electron jump. That's right. I remember that. And that was a lot of fun. That was it? a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right.